Good day, folks. Today I'd like to talk to you about an introduction to nuclear physics for alternate energy systems anyway, is a focus for what we're working with. So this is not the intro to nuclear physics for high school, you know, where it started with an amino acid and we go from there. So um, if you're looking for that kind of content, this is not it. This is in reference to our projects with the quantum cells and different metals and whatnot. So before I get too much into it here, I got to start with the introduction here, which is basically a little bit of high school review so you can see from what angle I'm getting at here. So this is basically the atom here. Since I'm not very good at drawing, I figured I'd print it out instead. So basically here we have a diagram of our electron orbits, the electron here, the neutrons within the center here, and then the protons and then the uh, nucleus. So um, just to make things clear here, the atomic nuclei versus the nucleus, because sometimes there's terminology differences and that could be very confusing and irrelevant to what we're talking about. And in this case, it's simply the one is the plural form and one is the singular form. So getting into this here is uh, we use the term basically a nucleon. So what that is, is it refers to generally the components of the atomic nucleus as a whole. So the nucleus consists of two types. You've got the protons and your neutrons. So your protons are these things over here inside the circle here, which would be our nucleon. So you've got your protons and you've got your neutrons. So the protons are the positive charge and the neutrons are the neutral charges. So what that means, there's a lot more in here, but to summarize this, to simplify it, basically the charge amount here, the rate, um, the number determines the element, essentially. And with the neutrons, the number uh, influences the isotope properties and the nuclear stability so slightly different systems depending on what it is you're interested in. So I just wanted to um, put that out there for now. So to, to make it seen in the chart here. So the nucleon would be everything that's embedded in this circle right here, okay? Which are your protons and your neutrons here, okay? And the nuclei would be irrelevant to a specific within this, so the proton or the neutron, basically. So this is just to um, put it out there so I can move on here. So anyways, folks, speaking of the nuclei, um, just some observations here. We're not really going to cover this part of it too much for our experiments because I'm not too much into um, exploring cold fusion and such. But for transparency, um, it's worth noting that some neutrons and protons are unstable. So uh, what that means is spontaneously they'll decay. And it's this decay that it's the kind of like the natural balance, the way the environment tries to equalize a highly unstable system, so to speak. And what that does, obviously, is it will release energy. And what you get here is radioactivity either in the form of alpha, beta, or gamma radiation. But again, those are very advanced, and unless you have labs and, and you have the whole setup for this very hardcore nuclear um, exploration, I, I'd steer away from it for obvious reasons, but you know, it's part of the equation, so we have to include it in there for transparency. So we will move on from this point on. All right, folks, moving on. This is where it gets more relevant for our kind of research. And what's very important in this kind of um, physics is the binding energy curve. So what is the binding energy curve, you might ask? Well, that's the curve we are referring is the nuclear binding. It's the energy curve which plots the binding energy per nucleon against atomic mass. Atomic mass, which we discussed, is everything inside this circle here the neutrons and the protons here. So um, at certain points, so basically this reveals, so basically this reveals a great deal about the stability and the energy dynamics of the atomic nuclei, which is uh, as the individual sections of the nucleus, which is, you know, one is plural, one is singular, what I said earlier. 
So, um, got to watch those terms, right? But what this boils up to, folks, is at certain points, very important, notably around elements like iron and nickel, the curve reaches its peak. This is what's very important, folks, indicating these elements have the most stable nuclei. So this fits right into the Tom Bearden, the Floyd research, the conditioning of barium ferrite, and all of that in-between stuff, and even a little bit of John Hutchison. So moving on to the similarities and where it becomes um, relevant, well, we'll talk about that next. So now moving on to basically the one that a lot of people in this community already know about and what was very hot with Bedini, uh, Tom Bearden and Floyd and others were the exploration of the barium. And some possible um, um, reasons to the logic here is because the barium sits at the atomic scale 56 and it finds itself near the knee of this curve that we're talking about. So in simple terms, folks, what this means is the barium happens to be near the quote-unquote sweet spot. So what does that mean? Well, it's the point of the curve where the nuclei becomes progressively less tightly bound per nucleon as you move towards the heavier elements. So uh, basically, folks, this is exactly what Tom Bearden was trying to say in his own terms when he was talking about the properties of the barium and how the Floyd device in part may work. So this is why it was very important for them to research the barium. But with that said, let's move on, folks. All right, folks, so moving on here. The big question, why barium, folks? Why might it be considered? Why did Bedini consider it in his projects? Why was it such a point of interest for Tom Bearden and Floyd and the likes? So let's start with the curve position we were talking about. While it's not exactly at the peak of the curve for the stability, it's basically positioned in a region where its nucleus is sufficiently stable, yet potentially more reactive than most stable nuclei like iron or nickel, which is very close by on the scale here. And there's also the nuclear and the resonance effects. The barium has multiple isotopes with a variety of nuclear structures, so these can be influenced under specific conditions. For example, magnetic, electric, resonant frequencies. Tom Bearden claims about 400 hertz for barium, and of course, there's the binding energy value, the actual value in mega electron volts of BA, which is around 8.3 8 mega electron volts. And the sweet spot elements being at the peak of this curve would be the ones that are closest to 8.8, .8, just for reference, you know, so you have a bit of a reference. I'll include a chart of, of the common elements later on. But uh, basically what you're saying is, okay, what is he getting at with all of this? Exactly what Tom Bearden was getting at, folks. What this all means in short is pulse the element with an electric and have it near a magnetic and it will at a certain frequency give you back an additional output. As simple as that. So uh, why did Tom Bearden not say it as simple as that? I don't know, folks. You know what? Maybe what I'm starting to think at is um, overly complicating things making it seem like, you know, barium, exotic materials that are hard to find, will discourage many to do the advancements and of potential research in these fields and, and finding out all of these values and putting the pieces together. If you start off, well, I'm not going to find these exotic rare minerals, so why bother, right? But if you keep doing the research, uh, the science seems to differ from that philosophy, and this is where we're going, going to go into next. Okay, so now that we covered the um, interesting features of the barium and why they were so uh, intrigued with it, let's move on here. And this is what they don't talk about so very much for some reason. And there are additional candidates, folks. The science is all there for it. It's just we haven't really explored all the variations yet. Well, not publicly anyways. So this, the issue is transition metals like copper and zinc, basically. Uh, those are just located before the curve peaks. So these elements have unique electronic and magnetic properties as well and could be exploited as well to our benefits. 
So um, what I'm getting at is this is just an example here of two uh, different uh, metals, but the idea is there's definitely the same interactions going on here up and it's just very similar to our galvanic cells. Well, it's just a matter of finding the sweet spot near that area in the scale. And essentially, if the uh, element doesn't exhibit natural electromagnetic properties, it can most definitely at some extent be triggered with a, an external magnetic field nearby We're using a, an electromagnet or a regular magnet, it doesn't matter. But if you interact these systems, then it opens up the avenue, the doors, to being able to replicate the same conditions that the barium can natively do with the help of external triggers. What comes to mind with that, folks, is someone who was actually able to do that, and he's not shy at all from uh, bragging about it, was Bedini himself. He tried the barium magnets. He noted, yeah, it really works. But he started to think about it as well in this context here and realized that, you know what? I should be able to exhibit similar properties with the rare earth magnets as well. And he explained it that it will work with the Bedini device with rare earth magnets very well. And of course, it's not exactly the same mechanism, but with Bedini's external circuitry and his state of induced asteresis, he was able to, with the help of the bigger picture, his external circuitry, like I was talking about, if I won't do it natively, you could help it out. And that was his way of essentially achieving a form of the same condition as Floyd was getting with his magnets. But Bedini thought, you know, further than his nose and said, wait, I could do similar using other elements and it's just a matter of finding you know the frequency and where it's at in the scale to 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 make the determination whether or not it will exhibit these properties before you start with so very important information but they never framed it in the idea where yeah just go in your backyard you know like john hutchinson did and just test random rocks and you'll come up with some very unique combinations and if you want to start wafering up those cells you will indeed uh, bump into these very unique interactions that may very work at the quantum tunneling scale which i've uh, talked about in previous videos so all this stuff here is very important and it fits all into the big picture and trying to uh, figure out what's going on with our various experiments at the quantum and nuclear scale anyways very important so the next thing i'm going to do is for reference i'm going to mark the chart with all the um, values here for you so i'm just going to do that right now all right so here's the um, energy chart that helps us find the best uh, mev value which is the closest to the uh, knee of the curve here which helps us with our findings, so it gives us an idea of the scale anyway. So we start at carbon over here, which is 7.7 .7 MeV, oxygen, which is 7.98 MeV, magnesium, which is 8.3 MeV. And by the way, these values, folks, are the average, you know, um, under uh, normal condition, normal temperature, average conditions, because some of these here, depending on temperature, hot and cold, will give different results. And of course, folks, that's exploring a whole new um, field, getting into the flash cooling and flash heating of these elements. But we're not there yet. It's just on average just to have a baseline here to work with. So I was magnesium, uh, 8.3 MeVs, a silicon, 8.5 MeVs, a chromium, 8.6 MeVs, iron iron which is 8.8 .8, which is actually near the peak of the curve so around here would be ideal if we can figure out mechanisms to interact with it nickel here being 8.7 mev and zr here being 8.7 mev and mo here being 8.7 mev and the tin here being 8.5 MeV, that's quite interesting for the tin anyways. And interestingly enough, the barium here sits at 8.3. Now CE also sits at 8.3, and ND, which is the kind of um, rare earth magnets, also sits at 8.3 that Bedini was working with. Is it a coincidence that they're all 8.3? And also SN is 8.3 MeVs. 
So these combinations here, extreme focus, but we're not limited to just these. We could try it with thin as well. We could try over here with W, element W, which is 8 MeVs. There's also gold, which is 7.9 MeVs. And of course, there's lead, which is 7.9 MeVs as well. And when you start moving more and more, you get really far out of range, so, which would be ideal to exploit these characteristics. So with this chart here, it gives us a good idea of the elements we could experiment with. So um, with that said, folks, I hope that I've at least explained it in better perspective that uh, it's very important for energy systems and interactions and understanding the... Uh, and what this means, folks, is, you know, we're not just limited with barium to notice all these uh, exotic effects. Just about everything here, in some point, can be manipulated to create the same thing. It's just a matter of finding the clever combinations that work to trigger the effects. So with that said, folks, I'm going to leave it at that, and I hope you enjoy your day, and let me know what's on your mind.